I sort of hate to break the um, the party. Um, there's a really nice vibe in the in the room right now. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Whiting. I'm the dean of the Graduate School of Design, and I'm delighted to see all of you um, and welcome you to the 2024 Dunlop Lecture, hosting uh, hosted by Harvard's Joint Center for Housing Studies, and this year featuring Dr. Margot Kuschel on the toxic problem of poverty and housing costs. I'd like to note that before we talk about housing, homes, or homelessness, we should first pay attention to the ground itself. The GSD and Harvard are located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what we now know as Cambridge and Boston. I'd like to take a moment for all of us to pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past, present, and future and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. And speaking of land, I'll note that the next public lecture here at the GSD will be Professor of Environmental Studies and Geology at Mount Holyoke, Laurette Savoy, speaking from her book, Trace, Memory, History, Trace, colon, Memory, History, Race, and the American Landscape. That lecture takes place on Tuesday, March 26th at 6.30 p.m. Between now and then, there's going to be our Beaux-Arts ball in this space. So God knows what the place will look like <laughs> after that, but um, you're lucky to be speaking beforehand. I'll also note that we have live captioning available tonight for our virtual audience. Hello, Zoomers. Um, there's a puppy here somewhere, I think. Um, uh, so there's live captioning. So to enable the captions for our live audience, you just click the closed captioning icon at the bottom of the live stream window. For our in-person audience, live captioning is available at the link or QR code currently available on screen. If you have any problems, just go to the AV booth at the top of the stairs here. So returning to tonight's program, Chris Herbert, Managing Director of the Joint Center for Housing Studies and lecturer in the GSD's Urban Planning and Design Department, will give a full introduction to the event and our speaker. So I'm just the introduction to the introduction. But while I have the mic, I want to offer my appreciation of the entire Joint Center team for their work in advancing the topic of housing at Harvard, and importantly, for a broad audience well beyond. Housing has become an ever more critical topic here at the GSD, whether in design studios that try and tackle design problems of housing, say, atypical groupings. The uh, nuclear family is no longer necessarily the norm, so how do you design housing for groupings that you can't necessarily predict? Or how do you turn existing office, retail, and manufacturing buildings into housing? Or how do you mix housing with other uses, say schools, libraries, and markets? We also have faculty and doctoral students researching affordability, equity, fabrication, and history. Much of the GSD's work on housing is supported in some way by the Joint Center, which offers us a wealth of research and data, collaboration, funding, and friends. The Joint Center ties the Harvard to Kennedy, Harvard to, ties the GSD to Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, but I'd like to point out that this lecture is actually part of an exciting new collaborative network that connects the Joint Center for Housing Studies and the GSD with the Initiative on Health and Homelessness at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. They have a long name. The Government Performing Performance Lab at the Harvard Kennedy School and the Harvard Advanced Leadership Initiative. And this collaboration, this network, brings together knowledge from all parts of the university. So I think it's a very exciting moment. It's something that we, we speak of Harvard um, collecting knowledge from, from all corners of the university, but it's actually on a practical level, sometimes very hard to make those collaborations um, work or to enact them, to, to realize them. And so I'm, I'm very grateful for this new network. So I want to thank you all for attending. And now let me please give the mic over to Chris Herbert. Thank you, thank you Sarah. Um, I also want to thank uh, Howard Coe from the Chan School. 
Uh, Howard came to us a year ago with, as part of his initiative and said he was looking to build bridges to other parts of the university and nudged us in this direction. And this is part of the reason why we have uh, Dr. Cushell here tonight is in part due to Howard and the, and the collaboration and also our friends from the, the uh, Government Performance Lab at the Kennedy School. Um, you know, I think it, it's great to build those bridges. It takes willing partners. And so if there's any other potential partners in the room from across Harvard, we're willing to build those bridges. Um, so welcome to the 23rd John T. Dunlop Lecture. Um, this is our opportunity to host a distinguished housing leader to address the Harvard community. And now, thanks to the interwebs, we can address the wider world beyond Harvard as well. So welcome to everyone watching from home. Um, and I'd like to spend some time at each of these lectures to remember John Dunlop. John Dunlop was incredibly important to the Joint Center. Um, he was instrumental for many years in supporting the Center and ensuring our long-term success. And I just want to you know, take a minute to uh, recognize that long-term success. This is our 65th year of existence. We were founded in 1959. I don't know that there are too many centers at Harvard that have that longevity. And I think really John T. Dunlop was really one important reason for that. He was a professor of economics who started at the Great Depression and, and was active into the 21st century. He was a leader within the university. He was a department chair of the Department of Economics. He was the FAS dean. He was a university professor. Outside of the university, he was the Secretary of Labor under President Ford. He advised presidential administrations from Roosevelt through um, uh, Bill Clinton. Um, and he was also a really important mediator between labor and industry. And so John was someone who lived a life both within the academy and outside the academy, which is something that the Joint Center strives to do as well, not just be within the academy, but to reach outside the academy. One thing that John did was he established the Policy Advisory Board, which is a group of companies that provide philanthropic support for us. And that's one reason why we've been able to exist for this many years, by, by having that. And the, uh, Professor Dunlop, bringing that bridge between industry and academia was really important. We're really grateful to Professor Dunlop for what he did to, to allow a center like ours to have such a long-standing place at the university and to pursue our mission which is to improve equitable access to decent, affordable homes in thriving communities by conducting rigorous research to advance policy and practice, and by bringing together diverse stakeholders to spark new ideas for addressing housing challenges. And so tonight, we hope we've done that to bring together a diverse audience to spark new ideas for this pressing issue of how do we address homelessness in a country as wealthy as ours. So with that, let me turn to tonight's lecture. Um, we've had, uh, over the course of the 23 years, we've had a diverse set of leaders from policy, advocacy, home building, finance, and design. This is our first doctor, our first medical doctor. And so we're really grateful to Dr. Margot Kuschel, who bridges the worlds of research and practice in her roles as both a doctor and a professor of medicine. And so tonight's lecture, The Toxic Problem of Poverty and Housing Costs, Lessons from New Landmark Research About Homelessness. Dr. Kushel is Division Cha Chief of the Center for Vulnerable Populations and Director of the Benioff Homelessness and Housing Initiative at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital and Trauma Center. And you thought the School of Public Health had long titles. <laughs> She's also a primary care doctor at CSFG's Richard H. Fine People's Clinic. And so both doing practice but actually spending time in the clinics uh, serving people. For over three decades, she has both cared for people who experience homelessness and studied the causes, consequences, and solutions to homelessness, particularly in California, which is home to 30%, actually 28%, we heard today, of the people experiencing homelessness in the US, which is really just astounding. Tonight, she will discuss insights that emerged from her work as a physician and researcher, drawing significantly from a recent study she led, which is the largest representative study of homelessness in the US since the mid-1990s. She'll draw on the findings to discuss policies and programs and practices that would help people experiencing homelessness and those who are at risk of becoming homeless. You know, we were really drawn to invite her to give tonight's lecture because of the power of this study. We spent some time today at the Pine Street Inn and with students and talking about the fact that by raising this issue, which Dr. Kushel was saying that when the state of California came to do this study, she was saying, we already know this. And so you know, why do we have to spend all the time and effort to do this? But, but we, now we know it with numbers that some people need to have those numbers to be convinced it exists. And it's powerful. And it's really raised the, the consciousness and awareness of these issues. And so we're really grateful for her for her work and her chance to, to bring that here to us tonight. Following the lecture, we'll be joined on stage by Peggy Bailey, Vice President for Housing and Income Security at the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities, and Dr. Jim O'Connell, President of the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, to engage in a conversation about the findings and how we build on them to achieve the goal 
of making the experience of homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring. So with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kushel. Thank you so much for that introduction, um, for you all being here to the Harvard Joint Center on Housing Studies. I am one of those nerds who waits anxiously for each report and thing you put out. To David Leveroff and Chris Herbert for inviting me, and a special thanks to Peggy Bailey and Jim O'Connell, who are two of my personal heroes for joining me on the panel. I'm really honored to be here. Um, I was actually an undergrad here at Harvard, and I'm somewhat tickled to be giving a talk at the GSD, a place where I spent many hours actually waiting outside. I, um, I actually, my attempts at anything design related looked like an adult making a bad imitation of a toddler, so I was always a little intimidated to be inside. But some of my dear friends, including my roommate who's here tonight, spent a lot of time here, and so I was, I was outside waiting for them. Um, but um, I did spend a lot of time uh, very close to here, which really started my journey into this work. Um, a few blocks from here at the University Lutheran Church, or as we called it, Unilu, where I worked many nights volunteering at the student-run homeless shelter. When I arrived here at Harvard in 1985, the shelter had opened just two years ago, two years before that, as an emergency response to, what, to a crisis that really at the time seemed deserving of an emergency response. I think if you had asked me if I would be standing here nearly 40 years later talking about the growth and complexity of the problem, I'm not sure if I would have been more shocked or horrified, but here I am. Today I'm going to talk about homelessness as an enduring crisis that I believe doesn't have to be enduring and focus my remarks mostly on my adopted home state of California, which, while having many differences from how homelessness presents in other parts of the country, particularly the Northeast or the Midwest, um, it has many similarities to the West and the Mountain West, but I believe has lessons for us all. So I hope to leave you here today, perhaps with a new understanding of how we got here, what impact homelessness has on those who experience it, and to leave you with the sense of possibility that we can, in fact, even 40 years into the modern era of homelessness, still make different decisions which will give us different outcomes. I should say that I approach this work as a physician who has spent my career working in a safety net system, and therefore walking and working alongside those who have worn on their bodies the marks of a deeply unequal society. And, as a researcher who knows that the people closest to the problem are the ones who are closest to the solution, and we do best by listening carefully to them. So first, let's start out with my gorgeous home state of California. It really is a magical place. It really does look like that, by the way. A place of infinite possibilities and unimaginable beauty, and a place filled with strivers and dreamers. So your image of California may look like this, or perhaps this. Maybe it looks like this, or this. Or if you watch Fox News, your image may look more like this a California nightmare created by lax drug policies, incentives to not work, and disarray. The truth, as you can imagine, is much more nuanced. While the vision presented in the evening news doesn't really describe California, the truth is that much of our landscape looks like this. This is actually a photo I took last week of the Civic Center Park in Berkeley, near where I live. Um, Berkeley is a city much like Cambridge. And while people living outdoors has become part of the inescapable visual landscape of California, I'm gonna tonight not focus on the tents, but rather on the people dwelling inside them and focus on the question of how in a state as wealthy as California, we have over 181,000 people who spend their nights in shelters, in our, their cars, or in our parks or streaks. How we got to this place, what happens to the people living there, and what it's gonna to take to get out of us. 
Throughout this talk, I'm going to share some really incredible photos taken by some colleagues who I just want to um, acknowledge. Many were taken by Sam Komen, who working with um, Aaron Shank, a video journalist, uh, audio journalist, um, created a companion piece to our study called unhousedcalifornia.org, which I encourage you to um, take a look and listen at. And then another California photographer, Barbara Reese, took some of the other images. And I'm just going to note that we have everyone's permission to use their photos. And I will be quoting from people in our study, but not the people you see in the photos, just for reason of confidentiality. So in 2023, there were an estimated 653,000 people who experience homelessness every night in the United States, 181,000 of them in California. So to put a point on it, a state with 12% of the US population has 28% of those experiencing homelessness and approximately 50% of those living in unsheltered settings. To understand homelessness, I think it's really important first to give some framing of the questions that we ask. In their book, In the Midst of Plenty, Beth Shin and Jill Kaduri point out that when we ask the question, why are people homeless, we're actually often asking two very different questions. Why do some people become homeless? And why do so many people become homeless? If you ask the first question, we're drawn to answers that lead us inevitably to individual characteristics, substance use, mental health. But if we ask the second, we're really drawn to structural answers like the cost of housing or the low wages of low wage workers. The issue is that we actually are often trying to answer the second question with answers for the first, and that's where we go awry. In the early 2000s, Marty Burt, Laudan Aaron, and others noted in their book, Helping America's Homeless, that homelessness really arose from an interaction between structural factors, so availability of housing, income inequality, individual factors like substance use and mental health problems, and the presence or the absence of a safety net. They noted that the less forgiving the structural factors and the lower the availability of safety net supports are, the fewer individual vulnerabilities one needs to become homeless. In the United States, in 2024, you simply don't need to have that many individual vulnerabilities to wind up experiencing homelessness. And another favorite book of mine in 2022, Greg Colburn and Clayton Aldern in their book, Homelessness is a Housing Problem, and you have to love a book whose thesis is in the title, distinguish between what they call the drivers of homelessness or the underlying factors that determine the differences in rates of homelessness between communities, which is, they show, almost entirely dependent on the mismatch between housing prices and people's incomes. And then what they call the precipitants, things like substance use problems or mental health. To try to explain this, they draw on a terrific metaphor, the game of musical chairs, to understand how these interact. So they ask us to do a thought experiment. And in this thought experiment, the kids are people. I guess kids are people, but the kids are people, and the chairs are housing. So if you imagine a kid's birthday party, 10 kids, 10 chairs, the adult plays the music, adult pulls out a chair, turns off the music, and the kids scramble for the remaining chairs. What if they ask one kid showed up, let's say having sprained their ankle playing soccer the day before? That kid is on crutches, they don't really know how to use, and if you were a betting person, and if they were say to you, which kid is gonna be standing when we stop the music? It would be a pretty good bet that that would be the kid who was stuck there. But what if you asked a different question? Why is there a kid standing? Well, there's a kid standing because we have nine chairs, 10 kids, either two kids are sitting on top of one another, or there is gonna be a kid standing. The kids are standing because we don't have enough chairs. And furthermore, if you had kept the 10 chairs there, the kid on crutches would have eventually found their way to that seat, and you wouldn't have had someone standing. The reason we have so much homelessness in the United States is we simply don't have enough chairs. So how badly are we doing? How short of chairs or housing are we? The National Low Income Housing Coalition every year publishes a report on the gap between available housing 
and the need for extremely low-income households. Extremely low-income households are households that make less than 30% of the area median income for whatever area they live in. Nationally, we have 34 units of housing for every 100 extremely low-income households. When they say available and affordable, they mean a housing unit that exists, that's habitable, and that's not um, used by a higher income household. And when they say affordable, they say affordable at less than 30% of that household's income. Because if you're poor and you spend more than 30% of your income on housing, you're not leaving aside anything for rainy days, you're not paying for health care or other important needs. In my home state of California, we're at a whopping 24 units, um, although we are um, beat to the bottom on our neighbors to the east, Nevada, who have 14 units of housing for every 100 extremely low-income housing, extremely low-income household. If you map the states with the highest rates of homelessness, with the exception of New York, which I can talk about later, it is almost entirely the states marked red on this map, which are the states with fewer than 30 units of housing for every 100 extremely low-income household. And finally, one more thing before I start. Early on in um, giving a lot of talks about homelessness, I promised myself that I would never open my mouth about homelessness without explicitly calling out the way that structural racism, and particularly anti-black racism, plays in perpetuating and creating this crisis. Until very recently in our collective history, we had legal, unethical, immoral, and racist, but completely legal ways to restrict housing based on people's race. It operated through things like racial covenants, where homeowners could say, I'll only sell this house to someone who is white, creating sort of neighborhoods that were either white or people of color. Through the process of redlining, banks agreed to only offer mortgages, basically to people who lived in the neighborhoods that white people lived in, thus effectively shutting out black and brown communities from the post-World War II um, boom in home ownership. This is a single biggest contributor to the racial wealth gap that we see. Even though this has been illegal since the Fair Housing Act laws were passed in the late 1960s, we still live in those redlined areas. You could still draw those maps based on the racial characteristics of communities we live in. Um, we, um, although not legal anymore, there is widespread and well-documented discrimination in that housing markets. So for instance, for rental housing, if you are a white family and you show up to rent a house um, with the same rental resume as a black family, you're much more likely to get it, meaning that black households wind up spending more for lower quality um, housing. And you add to that the very well described and well um, known sort of discrimination in our criminal legal system, in our employment system in our educational system, and of course we fund our local public schools with local tax dollars. So disinvested neighborhoods have fewer dollars to play with. Perhaps it is not a surprise that black Americans are three to fourfold overrepresented in the homeless population. With that background, I want to delve into our findings from the California Statewide Study of People Experiencing Homelessness. We released this um, this past June. As Chris said, this is the largest representative study of homelessness since the 1990s. And we at the Benioff Homeless and Housing Initiative um, conducted this at the request of the California Secretary of the Health and Human Service Agencies. To guide a representative sample of adults 18 and over, we basically divided the state into eight regions. We plugged a lot of information into a model and chose one county from each region that would allow us to draw conclusions about the state as a whole. We used all sorts of methods to generate a representative sample from each of those counties. So we took a random selection of all the encampments and shelters and drop-in centers and a random selection of the people in there. We knew that we would miss some populations doing that and so we used something called respondent-driven sampling to find hard to reach populations like farm workers or members of the LGBTQ community or um, young people. And then um, we recruited 3,200 people, did a structured interview, and for about one in eight, or 365 of them, based on their answers to the questionnaire, we selected them for an in-depth interview to really learn more about the how of what was going on. 
We did all of this in English and Spanish and used interpreters for any other language. And although it's hard to get less community engaged than to have sort of the governor and the um, leader of a major agency ask you to do a study, we were committed to community engaged practices and we conducted the study with the guidance and input of three community advisory boards, including one um, importantly made up of people with lived experience. Um, so let's get to some of the results. Who experiences adult homelessness in California? So the first thing to know is that Californians experience homelessness in California. In fact, 90% of the adults experiencing homelessness in California lost their last stable housing in California. 75% did so in the county in which they were experiencing homelessness, and a significantly higher proportion of people experiencing homelessness in California were born in California than Californians overall, like me, who was born in New York and moved to California as an adult. Black and indigenous Californians were dramatically overrepresented. 26% of adult homeless Californians report a black racial identity. In our state, 7% of all adults do. 12% reported a Native American, Alaska Native, or indigenous identity versus 3% statewide. And 35% reported a Latino, Latinx identity. 69% were cisgender men, 30% cisgender women, and 1% identified as trans or non-binary. But when you got to the lower age groups, those numbers went up exponentially. So 6% of the young adults were trans or non-binary. <clears throat> the median age of the homeless population is aging. In fact, the median age of homeless adults in California is 47, with a lower range of 18, because that's how we set the study, and our oldest participant was 89. 48% of those who were single homeless adults or not living with their minor children were aged 50 and over. And of those 50 and over, 41% had never been homeless, not even for a night before the age of 50. As one of our participants said, I never thought in my wildest imagination it's 64 to be in this predicament. Once people became homeless, they stayed homeless a very long time. The median length of the current episode of homelessness was 22 months, and 38% met federal criteria for chronic homelessness, which is both how long you're homeless and if you have a disabling condition. So how did people come to be homeless? 19% of Californians who entered homelessness did so directly from an institutional setting, primarily prisons and long-term jail stays where they were discharged immediately into homelessness. 32% entered from a housing situation for which they had some legal rights, either a lease or a sublease or in a small number of cases, a mortgage. But 49%, almost half of our sample, entered from housing but housing for which they had no legal rights, meaning they were doubled up with family or friends or otherwise sort of staying at the mercy of whoever they were staying with. For many, they lost their housing slowly and then all at once. We heard from many people that they had moved many times, each to a less stable and lower quality housing unit before they finally lost their housing. This was true for both leaseholders and non-leaseholders, because in fact, non-leaseholders were mostly people who had one more step in their journey and had a family or friend who could take them in. So this played out like so. A family would tell us that they had lived in a two-bedroom apartment that they rented. They had some income shock or some other problem, and they moved the family into a room that they rented in somebody else's house. That would then fall apart, and they would go and stay at their brother's, that fell apart and they moved into their car or outside. People had remarkably little warning prior to losing their housing. The median warning overall was five days. For non-leaseholders, it was one day. And for leaseholders, 10 days. For non-leaseholders, overcrowded, stressful situations, things would just fall apart really quickly. For leaseholders who technically should have had longer warning because of relatively strong renter protections in California, they would get a warning about an eviction and not wanting an eviction on their record, not knowing where to turn for help, 
they would just leave almost immediately. There is no way to talk about homelessness without talking about deep, deep poverty. The median monthly household income in the six months prior to homelessness was $960 a month. For the non-leaseholders, it was $950 a month. 43% of them were paying no rent, and there, those who did pay rent had median monthly housing costs of $450. For leaseholders, the median monthly household income was $1,400, and the median monthly housing costs of $700. Two notes to that. If your household makes $1,400, you cannot sustain $700 of monthly rental costs, but once you lose that housing, there is no place in California you can re-enter the housing market for such little money. We were going to get an apartment together, my husband and I, or partner and I, but he died last month. So now I'm up to paying full rent. This is someone talking about right before they became homeless, which is 700, 800 to start with. I can't pay that. I can't pay that much. It's a lot to pay PG&E and get groceries too. It's just not possible. The main reasons people gave for leaving their last housing differed a lot, whether they were leaseholders or non-leaseholders. For leaseholders, over one in five said that somebody in their household lost income. Either their hours got cut back, someone got sick, someone died, or some other way that the household lost income. For non-leaseholders, though, living in stressful, overcrowded, financially constrained conditions, about a quarter said it was interpersonal reasons. 13% said they had a conflict with someone else they were living with. 11% said they just felt like they couldn't impose any longer. No matter the reason, it was devastating. One of our participants told us the first thing I did was I cried because I couldn't believe that I was actually homeless for the first time ever. I've always had a job. If I was unemployed, I was never unemployed for more than a month before finding another job. As time progressed, those things became harder. For the most part, homeless Californians were optimistic that well-timed, relatively small amounts of financial resources could have meaningfully stayed off their homelessness. We asked them to imagine what could have prevented it for at least two years. 70% thought had they been given three to $500 additional income, that would have done the trick. 82% thought a five to $10,000 one-time payment would have, and 90% thought something like a housing choice voucher. We basically described to them, you know, a voucher that allows you to cap your rental payments at 30% of household income would have done it. So what was the experience of homelessness like? In a word, harrowing. In one of our participants' words, most of the time we're running around trying to figure out where we're gonna sleep at night. We're not worried about going to the doctors or going to see somebody or going to get help with our mental state. For the most part, people experiencing homelessness in California when it were unsheltered, often looking something like this. In the prior six months, 78% were primarily unsheltered, 21% living in a vehicle and 57% in a non-vehicle. That leaves only 22% who are primarily sheltered. 41% of our participants noted that at some point during this episode of homelessness, they had tried to get shelter, but it was unavailable to them. Homeless Californians' health was extraordinarily poor. Almost half, or 46%, noted that their health was poor or fair. This is about three times what we would expect and a relatively good marker of who's gonna wind up in the hospital or is gonna wind up dying. 60% reported a major chronic health condition, even though we would anticipate that they'd be underreported because of poor access to care. These were things like diabetes or a significant cardiac or heart condition. And 34% of all adults reported a limitation in at least one activity of daily living, like dressing or toileting on their own. 83% reported having health insurance. Um, this, I think, is a marker of our expanded Medicaid access and a lot of attempts to get people signed up. 62% said they had a regular place to get health care that wasn't the emergency department, so a clinic or a doctor's office. Despite that, 38% had visited an emergency department 
and 21% had had an inpatient hospitalization just in the prior six months. This was um, one of our participants, by the way, out in an encampment. Of those assigned female at birth and under the age of 45, 26% had been pregnant at some point during this episode of homelessness. 40% of those young people, age 18 to 24, and 8% of our participants were homeless on the day that we interviewed them, 8% of those younger assigned female at birth. <clears throat> Homeless Californians' mental health was extremely poor. In their lifetime, over a quarter, or 27%, had been in a psychiatric hospital. But 44% had their first psychiatric hospitalization after they had become homeless. 31% had attempted suicide at some point in their life not just had suicidal ideation, but had actually tried to end their lives. 25% reported a post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis. Many reported serious mental health symptoms, but most of these reported depression or anxiety, which were by far the most common symptoms. However, 12% told us that they were currently experiencing hallucinations, and 5% reported a recent psychiatric hospitalization in the prior six months. Of those who reported any mental health symptoms, only 24% had received any type of treatment, a medicine, talking to someone, peer treatment, anything in the past 30 days. Substance use was common. 35% told us that they used either methamphetamines, opioids, or cocaine at least three times a week or more during the current episode. But this was primarily driven by methamphetamine use which is by far and away the most common substance used. While 11% reported regular use of non-prescribed opioids, which in California is mostly um, fentanyl, most who used opioids did so in the context of using methamphetamines. Very few people were using opioids alone. 11% of our participants reported having survived an overdose during this episode of homelessness really serving as a marker of all of those who did not survive. 9% drank heavily, at least weekly, and 40% had either an illicit drug or heavy alcohol use. Few were receiving any treatment for their substance use. Only 10% were receiving any treatment, and much of it was through peer support, as opposed to through medications or other evidence-based treatment. Of those who had current, regular, illicit drug use or heavy alcohol use, 21% told us that they wanted treatment currently and had tried to access it, but been unable to find it. Many reported using substances as a response to their homelessness, as opposed to as a trigger for it. In fact, a third of those who use regularly only started to do so after they became homeless. One participant explained this to us. I started, I guess you could say, using when I became homeless, meth. I would use it to stay awake at night. So it's not like I would need a fix in the daytime or nothing else. And while homelessness is, in fact, a housing problem, there is no doubt that both because of the way in which homelessness is more likely to impact those with mental health and substance use condition, because the trauma of homelessness worsens these conditions, and because homelessness interferes with people's ability to get help. The end result is that many who experience homelessness have significant burden of mental health and substance use problems. Of course, when we study homelessness the way we did at one point in time, you're gonna overcount those who have these problems. But on the other hand, it really does give an accurate snapshot of who is out there now. We tried to come up with a proportion who would likely need additional supports and services. And we found that only half, that almost half, 48%, had one of four problems, either current regular illicit drug use, heavy alcohol use, current hallucinations, or a recent psychiatric <laughs> hospitalization. So how traumatic is homelessness? Well, this is one measure of the trauma. Over a third, or 36% of everyone, reported that in the prior six months, they had had their belongings taken from them in a forced displacement or homelessness sweep. 
These sweeps by government officials resulted in them losing their belongings. And by belongings, I mean things like their ID, their family photos, their medicines, their cell phones. 30% reported at least one short overnight stay in jail during this episode of homelessness. The median length of jail stays was two days. As a participant told us, the police would show up and man, there they are, tapping me on my shoulder and they'd want to search me and they'd find drugs on me or something and off to jail we went. The violence that people experienced while homeless was constant, terrifying, dehumanizing. 36% of all participants reported that they had been physically assaulted during this episode of homelessness, almost half of which was perpetrated by a stranger, someone completely unknown to them. 10% had experienced sexual violence, and this was more common in cisgender women, 16%, or trans non-binary people, 35%. Of those who experienced a sexual assault, 54% said it was perpetrated by someone they had never seen before, a stranger. This is one of our participants. And I pray every day that it comes to an end because I'm tired, you know. Not only do you have to deal with break-ins regularly, you have to deal with a male who might want to physically violate you violently at that. There's robberies galore. There's always breaking and entering. So what is keeping people homeless? First, everyone wanted to be housed. Despite the rhetoric you might hear, we certainly couldn't find somebody who said that they didn't want to be housed. But simply the rent is too darn high. 89% said that the cost of housing was a major impediment to their exiting homelessness. But there were other barriers. About 2 thirds said that they didn't have anyone to help them find help getting housed. Over half told us that they didn't have documents or paperwork that they needed. Half said problems with past evictions or bad credit had haunted them. 43% noted that they had experienced discrimination on the rental housing market. And 36% reported having a criminal justice system record, including those random jail stays, was a barrier. But despite this, people yearned for home. Although many wanted help, few were getting it. Fewer than half had received any formal assistance in finding housing during this episode, and only a quarter had received help at least once a month in the prior six months. There's just not enough resources out there for people who want to get out of being unhoused. You just kind of seem like you're stuck there. Even if you're trying to get a job, like you have to have an address. And if you don't have an address, you can't get a job. If you can't get a job, you can't stop being unhoused. People were, for the most part, clear-eyed about what would help them regain housing. 86% thought three to $500 a month would help them quite a bit. 96% thought five to $10,000 would. 96% thought a housing choice voucher would. And 94% thought having a housing navigator or someone to help them find that housing would make a real difference. Everyone dreamed, yearned for home, dreamt about it, and hoped for it. You be cold and freezing in the tent sometimes. You've got plenty of blankets, gloves, hoodies, jackets. But it really makes you appreciate being inside. You can bathe when you want to. I was going to flush the toilet when I get in my apartment just so I can hear it. You don't realize how important it is to be inside. I know that I would cut all my limbs off if that's what it took to pay my rent for the rest of my life. And I would never have to be outside again. That's what I would do. Having a place, a stable place over your head is the most honorable thing you can give yourself because you can eat, you can sleep, come and go. Yeah, see your grandkids. They come to see you because you have somewhere for them to come to. It's the most beautiful thing. So where does that leave us and where do we go from here and how do we fulfill this yearning for home? I would say that this crisis is, in fact, the result of bad decisions, but I'm not referring to the decisions made by people experiencing homelessness. Homelessness crisis is a result of policies that left us with an ever-widening income inequality that have left many constrained by generational poverty. 
by decisions that have led to disinvestment in the federal support for affordable housing, which has left us without sufficient affordable housing being created and left all too many without enough to pay rent. Policies that today provide only one housing voucher for every four households who qualify it for it. It is a result of zoning policies that have restricted building such that we have been unable to keep up with demand and contributed to skyrocketing prices. It is a result of the erosion of our safety net that has failed to catch people when they struggled to the widespread stigma and criminalization of substance use and mental health disabilities and the criminalization of poverty itself that has resulted in a response that punishes those most victimized by our collective policy failures. These policies were created in a country that has never really wrestled with our original sin of structural racism in the way that that has shaped so many of our decisions. And while it is really easy to blame people impacted by homelessness, doing so not only is not fair or right, but it also isn't gonna get us any closer to a solution. The good news is that problems created by poor policies can be reversed, and it won't be easy, but to believe it is impossible is to ensure a future that is not only to those of suffering its harmful effects, but frankly, it's harmful to us all. Ending homelessness will benefit us all. So where do we go? I think the first thing we need to do is to recognize that every single path to ending this crisis flows through housing. And not just any housing, but housing that is affordable and available for the lowest income households. So we need to expand rental assistance programs. As I mentioned, housing choice vouchers only serve one in four. We need to um, make sure that it is easier to use them by creating housing abundance and by strictly enforcing anti-discrimination laws. We need to expand support for the development of affordable housing, recognizing that it is extremely unlikely that the market is going to solve this problem on its own. We need to expand and operationalize targeted homelessness prevention by identifying those at highest risk and intervening before people become homeless, including preventing homelessness among people we are discharging from our institutions. We need to increase incomes, both for those who work and those who have disabilities and are unable to. And we need to expand outreach into homeless encampments and places where people are to help people to survive where they are now and to help them get into housing. We desperately need to embed racial equity into all of these decisions. And we need to double down on the interventions that have been proven to end homelessness. I wanna focus on housing first, which is a philosophy that views housing as the source of stability. It says that you do not have to be sober or engage in service as a precondition for housing. And I wanna say that not everybody who experiences homelessness needs a whole bunch of services and supports. Many simply just need housing that they can afford. But for those with severe behavioral health disabilities, Housing First pairs subsidies with low barrier and appropriately robust services offered voluntarily to support the ability of tenants to thrive. Housing First is not housing only. There is very strong evidence base for its effectiveness, but that evidence base assumes that the housing is paired with appropriate services, often called permanent supportive housing. We will not solve this problem by denying the enormous trauma that people who have experienced homelessness have been through, many of them for years, and we need to acknowledge that this many have significant behavioral health conditions, but also acknowledge that those with behavioral health conditions deserve and are able to live in the community as long as they have the appropriate supports. A few years ago, we were asked to evaluate um, an intervention in Santa Clara County, the most expensive housing market in the country. They basically asked us to look through their records and identify the highest risk, most complicated people experiencing chronic homelessness. We used big data and identified 426 people with the highest use of multiple services like jails, psychiatric emergency departments, emergency departments. And just to give you a sense, for the people we enrolled in the past two years on average, they had had five inpatient admissions, 19 ED visits, 
a large number of psychiatric ED visits for jail stays, these folks were had a lot of impairments and problems. We didn't actually have enough housing for all, so we randomized them. And how it worked was, we didn't wait for them to come to us. We knew that they used a lot of services. We put flags in their charts, and so they would show up in jail or show up in the psychiatric emergency department, and someone with the team would show up the next morning and say, hi, you've never met me before, but I'm wondering if you would sign these 20 pieces of paper so you can be in a study for a 50-50 chance of getting housing. This was after people generally had been up all night having what was a spectacularly bad night. We had two people say, I'm too tired, come back later, and one of the 424 others said no. Every other person said yes. Of those randomized into the housing arm, 86% um, by the time we published the study, four years later, had received housing. It took a median of two months from the day we showed up unannounced at the jail or at the emergency department until they moved into housing. By the time we finished the study at seven years, 91% had been housed. And once they became housed, they stayed housed. Amongst those housed, they had more than 90% of nights for the next many years remaining housed. We saw a big decrease between the intervention group and the control group, and by the way, well over 30% of the control group also got permanent supportive housing because we didn't restrict them from other opportunities. But we saw significant reductions in the use of the psychiatric emergency department, significant reductions in shelter use, and a big increase in outpatient mental health treatment, although not one bit of it was required. These were the folks who were thought to be the most difficult to house, and they were housed. We actually do know how to do this. It is really hard. It takes a lot of funding, and it takes trained and appropriate staff with appropriate ratios, ongoing funding for housing and services, but the price of not doing it is simply too high. The yearning for home is too fundamental and important for health and well-being. We do have it in us to build a better future. It won't be easy to do it, but we really need to. We need a new commitment to creating a future in which everybody can know the safety and security of home. And the time to do so is now. I'd like to just really quickly thank some folks. These are our incredible lived expertise board who walked with us every step of the study. And it is an honor and a privilege to learn from them and work alongside with them. These are the amazing, some of the amazing people at the BHHI who made enormous sacrifices to make this happen. I'm going to leave you with a QR code for the study and our contact information. And thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much, Doctor. That was uh, tremendous. Um, your, your description of the life uh, experience of being homeless as harrowing, I think, uh, only begins to capture it. But uh, uh, thank you so much. And, and uh, I want to welcome our other panelists up here. So we have Peggy Bailey, who is Vice President for Housing and Income Security at the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities. Previously, she was Vice President for Housing Policy. She just rejoined C, uh, C -P -P -B, CBPP, that's hard to say, in 22, after having spent two years in, in the Biden administration as senior advisor to, uh, for rental assistance to HUD Secretary Marsha Fudge. She's worked for the Corporation for Supportive Housing, the National Alliance to End Homelessness. Um, and I love this statement from her bio. Throughout her career, she has helped build connections between the housing community and the health systems of care amid growing recognition that access to stable, affordable housing is a necessary foundation that enables people with low incomes to meet other basic needs and make progress toward achieving their hopes and dreams. And Peggy is one of the few people who's bilingual. She speaks both housing and healthcare, <laughs> um, both of which are really complicated languages if you spend any time with us. Uh, but Peggy, um, thank you so much for being here with us. And, and Dr. Jim O'Connell, who is a professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School, so he's a colleague across the university, president of the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program, where he's worked since 1985 when he was the founding physician of the program, served as the national program director of the Homeless Families Program for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and HUD, 
widely published in medical journals. He has his own book, Stories from the Shadows, Reflection of a Street Doctor, but published in 2015, featured by uh, in Fresh Air with Terry Gross. I think we can probably find that online somewhere. Um, and it was also his work at um, the Boston uh, Healthcare for the Homeless Project is the subject of the best-selling book, Rough Sleepers, Dr. Jim O'Connell's Urgent Mission to Bring Healing to Homeless People by Tracy Kidder, published just last year, which is a really tremendous book that really, um, I think, humanizes the folks in the field. and. Dr. O'Connell hasn't read it himself, um, but I, I, I appreciate the, I, the, how difficult it can be to read stories about yourself, and perhaps you know you have a different view sometimes of those things that, as they come through. But I think it's a really wonderful book. You should read it someday. <laughs> but thank you. It's really wonderful to have you with us as well. So I want to start, uh, Dr. O'Connell, by asking you about um, your experience in, in, in working with the homeless community in Boston for so many years. You know, Dr. Kushel painted this incredible portrait of folks experiencing homelessness in California. How does that resonate with your experience? What's, what's similar? Anything different? Sure. Is it? This is on. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, first of all, I have to say to Dr. Kushel, that is was a stunning presentation. Um, and while I read the study, I don't think I caught the full there's something about those pictures which are sort of breathtaking and heartbreaking at the same time that drive it home. So um, if we we hardly need anything else except what you just said, but um, it, but one thing we have talked about this homelessness is incredibly complicated as you saw, and I think you know when you look at what's going on in California and what's going on in Massachusetts, you might be talking about not the same population, but but different populations. And I think one of the struggles we all have now is what what Mar Dr. Kushik, can I say Mark? Okay. What, Mar what Margo has done, it, you know, we've been screaming to have done not only in California, but all over the country. And so if there's something that I would underscore is it trying to learn, get the numbers, who the people are, what we need to do so that we can come up with the, the types of housing, the types of support that are going to end it are really important. So I was really struck by that and I really am appreciative. The, the only other little thing I would say is that we, what we have seen in Boston is that the amount of service you need once some, once some of the very chronic. And one thing that should be pointed out that when housing first came along, people who had never qualified for housing, who were out in the street and could never get on medicine and couldn't you know, become sober, whatever it is, all of a sudden they, the most vulnerable people outside all over the country became those who got to get into housing. So it was a tough experiment because most people don't need much when they get into housing, as Margot so aptly pointed out. But some people need a lot of support or need to a lot of varied amount of support that goes is flexible and lasts a long time. And that's been the hardest challenge for us here in, in Massachusetts because we're housing such a vulnerable group. Um, and then my only last thing I would, I would point out is we're doctors, Marco and I are doctors. And I would always throw in that there's a medical need here in addition to a mental health and substance use. The leading cause of death for us is where is Travis, Travis Baggett, who's done a ton of studies on mortality here in Boston, you know, where drug overdose has now kind of become really our leading cause. Right behind it is cancer, heart disease, lung disease, liver disease, and trying to get the healthcare, the medical healthcare system to respond to the particular obstacles that people have to getting that care is really extraordinary. We need to add that, I think, into what the kind of services are we need. Enough said. I'm sorry. Thank you. But it was great, Margo. It was such a treat to be there. Uh, so, Peggy, um, as you read this, now you've been working in this field for a long time. And we get this, every time we put out a report, we get the question, what surprised you? And sometimes the answer is not much, because I've read this all before. But is there anything that came out of this report that surprised you? Or if not, what really stood out to you? And, and what's the, what are the policy implications of those findings? No, oh, thanks. Yeah, and Marco, I just want to say that it's just been great to be with you today and to see the, see the presentation of the study and know how much work went into it. I was one of the people that you called early on was like, don't we know this already? And I'm like, yeah, I think we, I think we pretty much do. But that's... I think what, so what, I don't know if it was surprise, but what really stuck out to me is that it's not the homelessness system that's gonna save us, right? Right, when you think about what people want, where the problems are, right? And, and so that means that the way that we've siloed off the homelessness system away from the housing and services systems is, is doing great harm. And so that's the other thing that, really struck me is that the things that 
you guys are working through are harm that we have caused to people. If we had given people the money that they needed up front, there's a lot of harm that would have been avoided if we had just done that simple that simple act. And so that's that's what really you know not so much surprise but just like shine through in the in the report more than anything else was just sort of the heartbreak of what we're doing to folks every day that we're not actually addressing their needs. Um, you know, one of the things that really did surprise me, and I'm not being as much of an expert as you all, was the, and you touched upon this in your, in your remarks, Margo, was the, the high share of people not engaging with housing navigator services or other kind of supports. You know, and you described today, we, we spent the day, we went, met with folks at the Pine Street Inn, we met with some students, we, heard, we talked about, uh, we got a lot, chance to hear from, from Margo quite a bit today. And um, you know, describing someone who's in this encampment, they've lost their papers, they have no documentation, they don't have a phone, and it's hard for any service provider to find them. And then the question is, is you know, as you described, they want housing, but it's like, and so as people walk by and say, well, right, what's wrong with these people? Why don't they just find help? There's no help there. And so it was really, I think that was really, really striking. So, so Jim, I, I guess we can call each other by our first names now. Um, uh, <laughs> You know, at your experience in Boston, is it similar to that? Are people having as much trouble finding help, housing navigators, or is, or is the situation in Boston any different? I think it's probably different, but I, I'm gentle when I say this. Um, I think Boston has done an ex extraordinary job, and I think you guys saw today, of, of getting people out, navigators out to get out there. And I think the problem we've learned is that you can get a lot of navigators out, but if there's only one house available, the navigators get frustrating because you, you wait months and months and months. And then the people they're serving start to give up because they say, you're not helping me. So our experience has been, it's really tough to go navigate unless you've got something you can bring somebody to. And sometimes it's better to wait until you have that before you discourage them. I don't know if that's something you've run into as well, but that's I mean, our problem. I think we have both problems in California, because I would call the navigation and case management necessary and not sufficient, for exactly the reasons Jim said, like if there's no place to navigate to, a navigator can only do so much. I think we have the additional challenge of almost everyone not only living outside, but being constantly moved. It's, it's really hard to even convey what it's like. People are just constantly being pushed away, and while they're being pushed away, everything they own, like imagine if everything you owned, your wallet, your, your bedding, your everything, your medicines were just tossed out, and so that complicates it even further. We definitely saw for the people who were in shelters, they had much higher rates of housing navigation. It was really the people outside. But but the other problem is like you can have all the case managers and having housing navigators in the world. If you've got nothing to navigate people to, it, it only gets you so far. But the, the, the one thing though I want us to start to think about more is what is is the, sort of digging deeper yeah. into into the what we call the lack of housing, yeah. because the way that we've designed the system, the person doesn't have control over being able to necessarily find the place to live. The landlord holds a lot of power because the way that a housing voucher works is the housing authority works with the landlord, and if the landlord doesn't agree then the person doesn't have a house. So it doesn't necessarily mean there's not a unit for the person to go to. It means that there's a landlord, there's not a landlord that's willing to rent to them. And that, thinking about it that way, along with the lack of income that people have, help I, yeah. is really important because we really have to right size the supply part of the conversation. All of, we're, when we're talking about the affordable housing crisis, we're not solely solving for homelessness. We're partly solving for homelessness, but a lot of people have a place to live that if we gave them more money or a subsidy, they could stay there. Yes. There is definitely a need to build units in a lot of places, especially in California, but we have to tease out what we mean by the affordability crisis, what the root cause of it is, and, 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 under, and right size this idea that we have to build more because I worry about who profits off of building more and encourages us to talk about building, building, building 
and it takes away from the need for subsidies and the need to preserve the existing affordable housing that's out there. I mean, we, we talk in California always about the three Ps, right? Like preserve, protect, and produce. You know, in California, we, we actually have, we probably just don't even have enough units. Like we are really, really short on housing for all income levels. But, you know, we also don't have any subsidies. I mean, Cal San Francisco opened up our housing choice voucher waiting list for the first time in a decade for two weeks in October to November. I think about 60,000 people signed up. Our city has like 700 or 800,000 people in it, by the way. And they were gonna lottery something like 5,000 of them to get a voucher. So like, there are no vouchers, there is no housing, but it drives me, it, it's sort of upsetting to me when the, the dialogue is like, it costs $650,000 to build a unit of housing for a homeless person, and I'm like, you know, People experiencing homelessness, they like live in the same units we all do. Like it's sort of like right. they're it's not the different. They're not housing. like from Mars or something, and they need Martian housing. Like all, it's it all counts, right? But we have such inflexibility. So in some parts of the country, like I think in California, we really made a mess of our building, and we really don't have enough units. We don't have enough subsidies, and and the way we control them as well. But this idea that like each person who's experiencing homelessness needs a specialized unit built for them feels really problematic. And, and I would I jump in in this in response to you. So the 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 rental the the vacancy rate in Boston right now is zero point six five percent. Yeah. So that best. means. Yeah. There are landlords out there, not many landlords out there who have a unit yeah. <laughs> open right now. So the dilemma for us is how do you handle that? What, you know, you've got to build because we don't have enough housing and we, God knows we have to prevent homelessness. So there are so many people on the edge, as you said. So I, I worry about what, you know, people get discouraged because of that. So how do we increase the stock? Because I think that you're, you guys are absolutely right. We're never going to solve this without enough housing. And it's clear that we do not have, at least in our city, we do not have enough affordable housing. Um, and so we're, we're playing sort of musical chairs with the housing is what it comes down to. But the other thing you said that I would just love to point, what you said so beautifully is that um, uh, I used to get confused between the emergency response system yeah. to homelessness. We're part of, you know, we take care of people who are homeless and have been homeless for a long time, and that's our lives. But we're not solving homelessness. We're taking care of people who have been caught in the structural issues. The so solution has to come from somewhere else. Um, and so we often get that confused. It often comes at either or. And what we always worry about is do you take away the services that people desperately need or out there to put into housing or vice versa? And I wish we could have a, you know, a, some compromise. I, you, you've probably been able to do it with what you've done, Margo. But I see people going to one side, let's make that, create the housing because we'll never solve without that. Or let's put some money into services. Right. I mean, the truth is that we need both. And it's it's really just interesting, like thinking like a physician. When was the last time like we blamed our emergency department physicians and nurses for like like the fact that people are dying from diabetes? Like that doesn't really make sense. But like at least in California, the homeless service sector gets blamed all the time as if like they are not working hard enough or doing a good enough job. And I think to your point, um, Jim, like we have to keep people alive until, right, we can't, like it's not good enough to say we'll build you housing in 10 years because people are suffering now and struggling now and so we need to be able to do both. But we also need to remember that we can't solve this problem the homeless services sector can't solve this problem, and no amount of investments in that will end the crisis. It will keep people as safe as possible during it. You know, I, I think that we, when I, I walked in, I was saying we spent a lot of time talking about this issue. There's still a lot to talk about because it's so complex. And I think what this conversation is highlighting for me is that we, this is a very much a both end both and, 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 and conversation, right? So do we need to build more? Yes. We need to build more to keep the pressure off the housing market so we don't have rents going up by 15%, which is pushing strain for everybody. But it's not going to trickle down. It's certainly not fast enough. And so we need to have a lot more subsidized housing. And we need to have that conversation about how do we do that at the right scale. You mentioned Greg Colburn's book. I just want to give a shout out to Greg 
because in his last chapter, he says, okay, so how do we solve this problem? And he starts talking about what's it going to cost and looking at, in the case of Seattle, what would it t take in terms of tax revenue to start building housing at the scale we need and makes a case that says we can, you know, that we can do it if we really wanted to. But um, one thing I want to talk about was uh, in terms of the housing we need, permanent supportive housing. And so, you know, Margot, I really appreciate you saying it's not what we need for everyone, but it is what we need for a lot of folks who have experienced some real trauma and have experienced chronic homelessness. And it, it is, it's, a, it's a sector that's both underfunded but also under stress. You know, and I think very famously Skid Row housing in, in LA experienced bankruptcy. You mentioned in your remarks, you know, it's housing first, it's not housing only. And I, I think it points to the fact that it, as much as we might be able to create permanent supportive housing, if we don't give it the resources it needs to be fully funded and fully staffed and supported. So I just want to turn to this question about what would it take to have permanent supportive housing that's going to be really successful? I mean, so there you need not only the housing and the ongoing housing subsidies. A lot of what we're seeing in California also is like the state is pumping money into sort of creating new housing, um, but the state has to balance its budget every year, and they, they are really loath to do like ongoing rental or operating subsidies, and so there's this cliff there. So it needs not only housing, but ongoing funding. I mean, just think about your own house, right? You've got to keep the roof on and all of that. But it importantly needs the services, and I worry a lot in California that we have asked the housing sector to do a lot more than they can do. As Jim, as Jim mentioned, our housing supply is so constrained and it takes so long to get into housing that only the people who have the most pressing needs are given the opportunity to go into permanent supportive housing. The people with the most pressing needs are the people who need the most robust service environment. We were talking earlier, not everybody needs the same level of services and not everybody needs the same level of services forever, right? It waxes and wanes, you tend to need the most upfront. And so we're gonna need a dedicated funding source to create and sustain those services, and those services need to meet the need of the client, which is going to change in that person's own life. It might be much more at the beginning. But you know, putting someone in a housing unit who has significant medical problems, significant psychiatric problems, significant, um, let's say, substance use problems, they can succeed there, but they need a lot of services. We spend that money when we throw that person in prison, right? Like we think, we don't like close the prisons. We're like, oh yeah, another person in prison. We spend $150,000 a year or whatever it is that we spend to keep someone incarcerated, but we don't seem to be able to pivot and spend the money that we need to help people thrive in the community. And for some people, they'll need a lot of supportive services. Sometimes that will lesson over time. Sometimes people have a crisis and will need more, but we need some funding. And that's where it, it seems like to me, the healthcare system has its best role to play because those are sort of like health type things and it's something that healthcare providers know how to do, but we haven't made our healthcare system sort of funding flexible enough and nimble enough to do that. Yeah, I think to, just to pick up where Margot left off, I think that's really important because Supportive housing, actually, I mean, even in just talking about supportive housing, is, is, isn't is where the industry has gone. In California and in Boston, there's a lot of 100% or majority supportive, uh, one building that's mostly supportive housing, but that's not how supportive housing is largely being built around the country. It's integrated housing. Um, Dr. O'Connell and I, I can't call you Jim, I'm sorry, um, are on the, on the board of the Corporation for Supportive Housing. And the Corporation for Supportive Housing, we build almost as much affordable housing as we do supportive housing because it's integrated now. And so that's another reason why the healthcare system is so important because it's about the community. We all should be using the same healthcare system. Yes. We don't need to build a separate healthcare system. We need this healthcare system to do better. And, and that's one of the reasons why sustainability has been so hard is for a while what we were doing is creating a, a, another siloed system of supportive housing, a separate health Healthcare system for supportive housing, and we can't sustain the healthcare system we have right now. We need we ha we can't definitely can't 
um, sustain two or three or four when you count behavioral health being separate from primary care and all of that. And you know, Peggy, I'm just like reflecting if like if I'm taking care of a patient or Jim's taking care of a patient and they're housed and they have major abdominal surgery and have like tubes like that person in that photo, I can send a nurse, you know, into their house to go and teach them and make sure that they know how to do it and get them their supplies. And if that nurse needs to go every day for a while, they can do that. Then sometimes they're like, oh, they know how to do it. The nurse will come and check once a week. Like we do this all the time. It isn't like magic, but we have such separation between the mental health system and the physical health system. But we also sort of treat people who've experienced homelessness as some sort of different thing where the healthcare system can, should be able to do this. but like, you know, but it's so tied, we have it in our brains, like it's tied to the housing in this way that it, like that it's separate. Dr. O'Connell, so what's your experience been in the, in the clients or patients that you see, when does permanent supporting housing work well? What are those challenges? What's, what's your experience been with it? So our experience is that permanent support of housing really works well when you've got the support. Um, and I, I think, a couple things happen, at least from our side, and I'm looking, Dr. Ko is here, who's a psychiatrist on our team, um, and Jill, who worked on, did housing for, so we we, uh, we we work with a homeless program, and it has, as Margo said, a, a board of a board that has many consumers on it, who, um, interestingly, we spent, you know, the first 20 years we were doing it, we almost no one got housing, and then all of a sudden people started to get housing. And we ran into an interesting dilemma where our board members, said, because we thought once you're in housing, we'll get you integrated into the mainstream health system, although we like to think of ourselves as part of the mainstream. But um, they thought we would be abandoning them. If we had been their healthcare team for 20 years, you can't just abandon me because I'm going into a house. So we had to you know, sort of change our thinking to sort of provide services at home. So we do a lot of home visits. In fact, our team did about 2,000 home visits last year to just our own patients, right? Um, and it's like a whole new world. What people need when they're in yeah. housing after they've been on the streets for a long time is it really neat. It reminds me of like an old fashioned country doctor stuff. You need people to go to see you at home because it's really hard for you to get out into your new or old community. So we're, we're realizing it's a lot of work and it requires a lot of support. And people, you know, people do well and then they crash. People do well and then they crash. And you have to be there, particularly with the mental health services. You want to catch things, as Katie would say, early as they're just becoming symptomatic. Or if it's cancer, you want to get the diagnosis early. And our healthcare system, as Peggy knows too well, is not designed to do that. And what I worry about is we're taking two systems that don't know each other very well and assuming each of us are doing our job and then it'll be okay. Yeah. And I think we have to learn how, just like I love the fact that from the other Dr. Ko and you, Chris, and everybody here at Harvard have gotten together, and I'm sure it's what happens at UCSF. Because I think of it, this is a problem that has, you know, we did the medical schools, the nursing schools, the school of, the architecture school, the design schools, and then you need the business school and the law school, because this is a problem that involves all of this. Um, but it's very hard to integrate this in. Like, I, I know maybe a couple of academic medical centers in the whole country that have a homeless program. <laughs> Almost all of that is assumed it'll get done in the community, which I think is, you know, hurting us in a term of integrating. So I think the challenge, the long story, the challenge is once we get people into housing, how do you really make sure they have the supports and the supports are available when they need them? That's a real upside challenge that our health, my healthcare system, the medical system, does not meet. So, but just one, it, but also, but I would say like that is something that a lot of people want, right? Yeah. Like be, like the public health system in general would love, you know, maternal and child health care in home, um, home and community based services for other folks, right? Like that, it that in home care could permeate, you know, should be more widely available for, a, it, the, it looks different for different people, but we haven't operationalized the person-centered care that we started, to, what we used to talk about that now I don't hear the healthcare system talk about as much because it's so hard and expensive, right? And so that, 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 that's, that's all that I think is really important is really thinking about how that individualized care 
how we all need individualized care. I, I do want to make sure we leave time for questions from the audience. I don't know if we have Mike Renners up somewhere available. So uh, I don't know. Um, I, now I got to call him Dr. O'Connell. Did, did you want to add anything on that? Or? No, I was just going to agree. I think, you know, one, one thing that I'm cynical about now, I think housing should be a right to everybody, healthcare should be a right to everybody. But if you put it, both of those out to the marketplace, the very poor and the very vulnerable always get lost. Yeah. All right, questions from the audience. Do we have any? We got one right here? Okay. We, find a mic runner if you got your hand up. Does this work? Okay. Yep, here you go. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. My name is Max. I am a medicine resident at the Brigham uh, in the primary care program. I'll be moving to California in three months. Uh, your talk was wonderful um, and a tearjerker. Uh, thank you for your work. My question is so, California, uh, actually, San Francisco just passed, I think, Proposition F, uh, which basically will now require um, drug use screening uh, for anyone who's sort of receiving like money from the social safety net from the city um, and mandate treatment, which I think based on what we know is people are just like going to forego services. Um, what is the city doing? Like, like quite literally, like what are they doing in this? Like the governor and the secretary of health, like commissioned the study. There's so much evidence and yet the city is doing what is like against evidence. I mean, I think, um, hi Max, um, I think we're in a really tough time. I think that um, what I try to think about is that the the public is really struggling um, with, with the um, amount of suffering, this is sort of the most generous way to think about it, really struggling with the amount of suffering that they're seeing on the street. And, you know, as internists, we, we, the internist mantra is don't just do something, stand there. Um, it's like why I love being an internist. Um, but I think that there is this sense of like the public is like, we have to do something, we have to do something. And a lot of people with expertise in this said, okay, that's not, the thing to do, actually, like we've got long wait lists for substance use treatment. We have much more luck with people who are who are motivated and ready to get that treatment. So why are we going to fill spots with people who don't want it? And um, real fears, both that people will just forego benefits, and also real fears that it will squelch conversations within the privacy of the health system. Like that, you know, when you think about trust in the system, if suddenly your patient who you're trying to do motivational interviewing with thinks, oh wait, if I admit that I have a problem, are you gonna tell someone and my benefits are gonna be taken away? You know, there's a lot that's worrisome, but um, in California, um, we put a lot of decisions up to ballot measures. It's really common. It's, it's hard from an East Coast perspective to think about how we do this, but this is how we do it. And I think the public was like, well, we need to do something. And, um, and, and that is what we're doing. And, um, you know, it's gonna be litigated, I'm sure, as, as these things often are. Um, but I think when you do this work, you don't, um, it's not like everyone magically listens. And I think that we are at a, <laughs> as it were, um, I think we're at a little bit of a breaking point um, with um, the amount of, um, public suffering. It looks, just walking around Cambridge, it looks really different here. And I think people are reacting, in a, I would argue, inappropriately um, and not really getting at what the problem is. Um, but I, you know, I think they're just doing, coming up with things to do something so it seems like they're acting. The only other thing I would add, though, it's also a lot of blame, right? Yeah. That oh, yeah. The, someone's homelessness is their fault. Oh, and so we have to fix that person because something's wrong and not... Um, understanding that it's actually all of our faults it's, of and we and this rhetoric everyone's like they're coming from someplace else they're in right. it's a like language of like invasion and blaming and you know I, I like you know I look back in the Middle Ages where we thought epilepsy was like people possessed by the devil and we look at that now and we're like oh that's ridiculous I really hope in my grandchildren that they're gonna look back at the way we treat mental health disabilities and substance use problems. And I hope that they will laugh at us for treating these problems like moral failures, um, as opposed to you know complex responses to trauma and biology and suffering and, and seeking a medicine, as it were, that will help them. And there's a lot of blame out there because people don't want to admit we did this. 
we did this. Like we, we had 10 new jobs in the Bay Area for a period of time, or eight new jobs for every unit of housing we built. Like what did we think was going to happen? We have, you know, every 10 years, the wait list for housing choice vouchers opens up for two weeks and, you know, 5% of people get chosen. Like what did we think was going to happen? We have uh, what, time for one question from this side. Hi, thank you so much for being here today. Um, my name's Danny. I'm an architect. In all of your experience, what can architects and designers do better? I feel like I'm a cog in the wheel way far beyond, but I know I can do more. Anything that you see that we're not doing good enough. And thank you for that question, Danny. I mean, if you're asking, I, I, I actually called you into this, so thank you for being here, <laughs> School of Art. Um, I think, you know, does, how to design housing that has good community and support and stuff like that is, is absolutely mandatory. And there are some breathtaking examples around the country. Problem is, none of it is scaled up enough and none of it is talked, but I think you are critical to the solution. Uh, one of the things I didn't say is because one one issue that always comes up is should it be scattered site housing or should it be people all in one spot? Um, and uh, in Boston, up until recently, it's been all scattered site. Um, and then we run into this: there's no that people are lonely. The loneliness gets magnified. There's no community. There's no you know there's there's nothing sort of uh, what am I trying to say? There's nothing that calls you to enjoy where you are. Um, and then we've seen some places where the architecture has been totally different and community be happens. So we need that really badly. I'd be curious what both Peggy and uh, Margo have to say. The thing that comes to mind for me is in the preservation space and coming up with creative ways for um, preserving affordable housing, including public housing, um, trying to figure out ways to, when possible, you know, create, make that as disruptive, as not, dis, you know, as, as, as to, to limit the disruption to people's lives as much as possible. Um, and, and, and part of also being, you know, not necessarily being in the industry, helping people understand what will happen as communities are redeveloped. There's a, that's one of the biggest problems when we're redeveloping properties. We don't admit how our yeah. fault in yeah. letting them deteriorate and then helping uh, tenants understand what's going to happen and the possibility. And I think like folks who can talk normal language to folks to help them understand what's going to happen uh, during the design and renovation process could be really helpful. A hundred percent. I mean, I think like we we desperately need the architects all in here, both for the preservation, for sort of creative reuse. Like a lot of conversation is happening now in these downtowns that like we've got all these office buildings that are empty. I had I met an architect on like a shuttle to an airport and was explaining to me like what buildings could be turned into housing and what couldn't. You see a lot in California. They are taking one of we quickly brought a lot of housing online by taking things like motels and dorms that could, for a low cost way, be turned into housing. I think there's so much, you know, we are in a climate crisis. We are like needing to think about how to keep what we have safe in this climate crisis so that it's cool or hot or otherwise. There is like, this is like an all in problem that I think has been left too much to a small group of people working sort of under battered conditions trying to like stave off disaster. And actually what we need is, is an all in effort. I don't think anyone is just a cog. I think everyone needs to be all in on this. And we also need y'all to help other people understand yeah. how hard it is to turn office buildings yes. into apartments that was, and how impossible that, that is. We that need you to like, tell policymakers that so they'll stop talking that, about it. That conversation <laughs> I had with that architect in the five minute from like the shuttle to the airport, I have now told like 20, I was like, you need to find that architect. And I was like, light wells, elevators. Yeah. <laughs> it's not so easy. Um, I, I would just refer you back to Dunlop lecture from a few years ago. We had Michael Maltz in talking about his work in, with Skid Row Housing Trust. And you know, I think that the, the role of the architect there is all, not just to create beautiful housing within a real budget constraint. And Michael talked really uh, eloquently about how you do that as an architect and build in the design to the function of the building, but to build communal spaces that function for, the, for this community. And I think the lesson from Skid Row Trust, which went bankrupt, is 
build housing that is freaking durable yeah. <laughs> because it's this is a, a, a community that's been through trauma and there's going to be challenges in, in keeping those people housing. So I think there's, I would go back and watch the Michael Malton lecture. Um, we were out of time. There was so much we didn't get to. Uh, one thing I want to talk about is flag for folks in the audience to, to take another look at. The, one of the findings that I found surprising, I'm not sure why in essence, but it was the fact that 20% of people are coming in from an institution. 30% are coming from it being a leaseholder or a mortgage holder. 50% are coming from someplace else where they're not the leaseholder, couch surfing, staying with family and friends. And it has important implications for a policy because we were thinking about tenant diversion, like you know, moratoriums on evictions and the like, but half the people are already past that phase. 20% of the people are coming from institutions. There's only a third that are coming from there. So we have to think more creatively about how we help people to, to save off homelessness who aren't coming from off a leasehold. Um, we didn't get to talk about emergency va housing vouchers and the lessons learned from COVID, but you know, there's lots of things we did during COVID that we, we could learn from and, and expand. But I do want to give you all a chance to have like a lightning round. One thing you want the audience, the folks here, people watching from home to take away from as we think about how do we make homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurrent. Dr. O'Connell. <laughs> Sorry, surprise. Um, I think if there's one, th if there's one thing that I would want to share is please um, understand how complex this issue is. The housing is complex, the services are complex, and we need everybody to work together on that. We can't take sides. But I think what I want to say to Margot, what what blows me away among the many things that blew me away, is a thought that. Um, for 50%, I think it was, I don't remember, of the people over 50, that was their first time homeless. And that, I think, explodes our idea that these are, you know, we see so many people that are chronically homeless and the thought that all these new people coming in are older, and I just see that as a challenge, another challenge that we have to have for the future. I think for me, it's the pictures that you showed and, rec and realizing that none of them looked alike. Right, And so leading into the complexity, that means that whatever we're doing, it can't look alike. It has to be person-centered and, and remember that the, we're dealing with people, we're working with people, uh, and they're, they're gonna have unique needs that need to be addressed. I guess I would say like 40 years into this modern era, it's really easy to lose hope. And trust me, I often lose hope, but it feels like if we don't believe we can solve this, then we really, really won't solve this. And we need to actually take steps today because people are dying today. And we also need to build for the long term, thinking about the long term. This is a stain on all of us. And the suffering is just really just unconscionable. Every route towards this answer flows through housing flows through building a society that is less unequal and less cruel and to like speak out against these whiplash responses like Max called out that are just gonna actually potentially worsen the problem and really ask ourselves, your neighbors, everybody to like look at the real solutions. It's housing, 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 but it's also creating housing that people can afford and creating systems of care that will support people to thrive. Wonderful. Um, Margo, thank you for, for your work. Thank you for sharing it with us. Peggy and, and, and Dr. O'Connell, thank you for being with us and thank you for your work as well. So please join me in, in thanking our, our guests. <laughs>